Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and placed him on a pinnacle on the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The good news of the Lord. Dear sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Temptation, seduction, betrayal. Sounds like a Hollywood movie, doesn't it? No, this is just the overview of the readings of the first Sunday in Lent. First, we start with the fall of Adam and Eve. And we didn't read the, apostle, uh, the epistle text today, but Paul talks about the second Adam that comes uh, to replace the first Adam. The first Adam who failed and did not obey, and the second Adam, who is Jesus, who did. So we are looking to Matthew's portrayal of the temptation of Jesus. And Jesus is in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of desolation, a deserted area devoid of civilization. And we know that the wilderness can be a place, but the wilderness can also be a state of our emotions. We can be in the wilderness, in our spirits, in our emotions, a place where we feel lost, a place where we feel abandoned. Jesus is in the wilderness, and Matthew sets the stage for what is to come in his gospel. He sets the stage for Lent as we are going to live through these next weeks. Matthew goes into more detail than the others about this event. Remember what Matthew's themes are, that Jesus is a law-abiding Jew. That's important to Matthew. And therefore, Jesus fasts because that's the law. Matthew also changes the order of this temptation a little bit. It's very plainly about identification. That's what we're looking at in Jesus. Who is Jesus? So Satan's temptations go directly to the core of who Jesus is. The question of Jesus' identity. And Satan calls into question the relationship between Jesus and God, his Father. So he begins with the provocation. Is there any more provocative word than prove it? Do you ever have that as a kid? I can do this, prove it. I can, I can pass that test, prove it. It's just almost insulting, isn't it? And that's what the devil is doing here with Jesus, just insulting him. If you are the Son of God, Jesus knows he's the Son of God, but he says, if you are the Son of God, prove it. So this is the temptation. Each temptation invites Jesus to turn away from trusting God. If you're the Son of God, then he has all of these areas that Jesus can prove it. The first one, Satan invites Jesus to prove his sonship. He has a command. Let's have a display of power, Jesus. Jesus knows he has power. But let's have a display of your power. 
Satan wants Jesus to establish his validity and worth. How? Through his own ability, not God's. If you are the Son of God, prove it and turn these stones into bread, he's saying. He wants Jesus to take the place of his Father. And that's the key through all of these temptations, is that Satan is really provocative with Jesus because every temptation he's demanding that Jesus prove that he is the Son of God. The second one is to test God's fidelity. If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down from this pinnacle on this temple. Prove it. Throw yourself down. Because God will catch you. You know, don't you trust God? You know, jump. And God's going to send angels to protect you. What's the matter? Don't, don't you trust God? Prove it. Jump. And the third is a bribe, out-and-out -out bribe. Jesus knows that he is the king of the universe, that he has established the kingdom of God. He knows that the world belongs to him. And so Satan promises him power, glory, all that the earth can offer. It's tremendous. Look at all that is out in the world, and all of it is yours, he says. You can have all of the world if you just give allegiance to me. Bow down to the tempter. Then, Jesus, you can have it all. And he knows it's all his, doesn't he? He knows he came as king of the universe. He knows that the world belongs to him. For God so loved the whole world that God gave his son to die. Jesus knows that's him. Prove it, the devil says and I'll give it to you. In each case, he was challenged to prove his identity. Jesus lodges his identity, his futures, and his fortunes on trusting God alone. When he could prove it, when he could take the power to turn those stones into bread, when he could jump off of that pinnacle and be saved, by, he could do it. He knows he could, but he he defends God's trustworthiness. So how does he do this? When Jesus is tempted, he replies with Scripture. Oh, man. You know, if every time we had a temptation, we'd just get out our Bibles and read it, we might resist. And Jesus knows that. So Jesus quotes Scripture. Even being in the wilderness is scriptural. The Israelites were in the wilderness, weren't they, for 40 years, tested. They were chastened and purified, ready to inherit God's blessings and promises. And Jesus, too, is tested while he's out in that wilderness. He is purified. He is ready for his mission. The Israelites, on the other hand, failed to trust God. But Jesus does not fail. He fasts. He is tempted. But he wants to prove his trust in God. And when he proves his trust in God, then he's ready for the journey that is ahead of him. It's a long journey to Jerusalem. A new era, a new course is set. Now there's a connection between the fall that we read in Genesis and Jesus. They were tempted and lost. Jesus is tempted and survives. But we see in both cases what it means to be human. Now, if Jesus was not truly human, then what's the point of this temptation? He has to be tempted if he's going to know what we go through. Adam and Eve are both present and they are invited to mistrust God. Did God say you couldn't eat of all of the fruit of these trees? Well, surely you could because then you'd be like God. You'd have power. See how the tempter works? So the, the serpent calls into question God's trustworthiness. God surely didn't mean you couldn't eat of that one tree. I mean, what's the point? You can eat of that tree. The seeds of mistrust are planted. Satan invited Adam and Eve to fulfill their deep need, their core of being human, 
to not seek God, but to take the fruit. The temptation to be self-sufficient, that is a temptation. I can do this myself until all of a sudden you can't. You can't fight that cancer by yourself. All of a sudden, you can't be self-sufficient. It comes again to identity. Satan tests Jesus with that big if. How do you know you're the Son of God? Prove it. Wouldn't you like to know for sure that you're the Son of God? Prove it. Turn the stones into bread. Jump from the temple. Worship me. Then you'll know that you're the Son of God. Prove it. And then you'll be self-sufficient. Right? The temptation is the same as in the Garden of Eden, becoming self-sufficient. But Jesus refuses to establish his own worth when he's faced with the temptation. He refuses to give up his identity when tried. He remains dependent upon God because Jesus knows who he is and whose he is. Part of being a human being is that we are insufficient. We are not complete. We cannot be complete in and of ourselves alone. This insufficiency is a part of our condition. It's who we are. We are just not self-sufficient when it comes to saving ourselves. To be human is to be aware that we carry inside ourselves a hole, an emptiness. A hole that sometimes we think that we can fill ourselves. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They were still empty. We think we can fill that hole maybe by getting a new car. Or if we made more money. Or if I could just get a position of power. Always trying to fill the hole that's there. We labor, we make sacrifices, trying to obtain things. But the emptiness remains. Look at those people who have billions and billions of dollars. Some of them are empty. They have all this money, but they're empty. The gap cannot be filled. There is no permanent erasing of the whole except by trusting God. Maybe our goal in life, in faith, is not to escape our own limitations, but to discover God in the midst of our limitations. Maybe we learn eventually that grace is sufficient. Perhaps faith does not do away with hardships in our lives when we're frightened and alone. They are part of life. But maybe it is to give us the courage to stand in the midst of our trials and tribulations. Faith is not trying to survive. Faith is flourishing in Jesus Christ. Why did we have the incarnation? Why did Jesus have to become flesh and dwell with us because Jesus was tempted and therefore knows our struggles. Jesus invites us then to find hope and courage by trusting in God only. Not trusting in ourselves, our own abilities, but trusting in God. A God who calls us by name. A God who knows us. And when we allow God to call our name and we respond, then we can discover truly who we are, a child of God. Our identity, if we want the identity that God intends for us, is to identify as being in need of God's grace and turning ourselves over to God's grace completely. Amen.